Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Dr. William Sneblin coming to you from With One Accord Ministries with a, a video which is in part response to several questions we have had uh, concerning um, the uh, Masonic Auxiliary Body known as the Orders of the Eastern Star, Order of the Eastern Star. And uh, this, this group has been around for many years. In fact, it, it, it dates back to the 19th century. And before I get into it, I want to just explain concerns that people have. Uh, first of all, I want to tell, these are two true accounts. Uh, one goes way back to the, um, to the 80s. And my mentor and colleague, Ed Decker, had received a phone call from a woman who was the grand matron of the Eastern Star chapter for, it was some state in the Southeast, it may have been Virginia or Maryland, one of those states. And anyway, she was a, a very respectable, high-ranking woman. She was also a Christian. She was some sort of evangelical Christian. And anyway, she had gone into this Christian bookstore and found um, a little booklet that he had written called The Question of Freemasonry. And she opened it up, and of course, this is her own testimony to him, to Ed, that when she opened up to a certain page and saw the graphic therein, it was like the hair stood up on the back of her neck. And she called him and explained that for some time she had had a being the, uh, an entity that looked just like this graphic coming to her in the night and raping her. And the being was basically a, a kind of hermaphroditic figure with the head of a goat, uh, the torso of a woman, but the uh, genitalia of a man. And some of you are probably already going to guess what this graphic was. It was a picture of the set which Edit had put into the book to make a point, which uh, was the celebrated drawing that an occultist, a high-level occultist in the 19th century named Eliphas Levi, had done of bafflement. And I'm putting up a graphic here so those of you that aren't familiar can see it. And as you can see, it was a goat-headed figure with hermaphroditic uh, body and, of course, a pentagram on his forehead, etc. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the most iconic representations of the devil that is out there, at least in the last couple hundred years. Well, when she saw that, she, and, and he, Ed explained to her over the telephone that this is the principality behind the Eastern Star for reasons we're going to explore in a few minutes. And she was just horrified because she was a good Christian woman. And this thing was terrifying her many nights. And so she ended up renouncing the Eastern Star, resigning it. Uh, she even persuaded her husband, who was also a high-level bigwig in the organization, to, to leave it as well and renounce it. So hallelujah. Now, what a more recent thing that happened is we had a um, an individual a woman call us and she had a similar experience. I doubt if she knew what this other woman's experience was. And essentially, this woman told me that she had this entity, again, with the head of a goat and so on, come to her in the night and sexually attack her. And when she protested, she actually tried to use the name of Jesus and rebuke it, you know, which is what we recommend. And we use the word Yahushua, but, you know, whichever... We think Yahushua is more powerful. But she said, you know, I command you to leave in the name. And he just laughed at her. This thing laughed at her. And he said, you are my daughter. And he proceeded to, you know, sexually violate her. Now, this woman, as I talked to her, and this was a few years ago, 
She was a member, she was an officer in a local Eastern Star chapter. She wasn't a big high bigwig like this woman that in the first story, but it's a very similar account. And you might say, well, why is this? What does this have to do with the Order of the Eastern Star, which is, a, a if you've ever looked in it or if you've ever been a member of it, uh, it appears outwardly to be a relatively benign Christian organization. I mean, they sing hymns, they, they talk about the cross and, you know, all this stuff. But it's all kind of superficial. I'm going to go into now what, what the problem is. But first of all, I want to take you to a passage from the book of Acts, chapter 7, where it says, and this is verse 43, Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Now, that's, of course, from Stephen's sermon to the the people, uh, the Jewish people at that time who were, who some of whom were becoming believers and some of whom were opposing him. And uh, he was quoting basically from, from the prophets. And he ended up, you know, being, of course, stoned to death for saying that by the Pharisees and, and Paul, and before it was Paul, his name was Saul at that time, was standing there consenting to that stoning, we are told. Well, anyhow, here's the point. What is that star? What is the star of your god Remphan? And, of course, this is a big controversy, and we're going to do a whole video on that later, but I just want you to explain. I want to see, I want to explain to you, because this is, in a way, it's part one of a different teaching, that the whole identity of this star is critical to understanding the dangers of the eastern star. All right, saying that, let's get into this. The Eastern Star is a Masonic auxiliary body, to be brief. And it's got basically seven or eight or nine major officers, uh, the, the worthy matron, the worthy patron. And it cannot function, understand this, without a Mason being present as the worthy patron or the worthy associate patron. I was in the Eastern Star as an associate patron, so I went through these things, I know what they're about. And it looks pretty benevolent, but like many things in cults and the occult, it is not. And I want this to be a warning. If you are a woman, or for that matter, a man, because there are men in the Eastern Star who are involved in this, you need to get out of it and you need to repent. Now, everybody that's in the Eastern Star is not being visited by hairy goat demons. No, I'm not saying that. But the danger is there, and I'm going to explain to you why. Now, let me also say one other thing. If you want to know a lot more about this, we have a video, a, a DVD, called Ladies of the Labyrinth, about the Order of the Eastern Star, which is like two, a two-hour video teaching that has much more information than we have time to go in here. You can get that off of our website. Okay, so... Every Eastern Star meeting has a Mason presiding over it. That's a big problem in and of itself because there is an issue. I just want to talk about this briefly and parenthetically. There is an issue of headship here because even though obviously none of the women in the Eastern Star are Masons, they are often either married to Masons or their sisters or nieces, or some such, of a Mason. You can't really be in the Eastern Star, at least this was the case when I was in it back in the 80s, unless you were a relative of some kind of a Freemason. And however tenuous that relationship might be, if you um, became a member of the Eastern Star and took the oath and all that, because that you do all that, it's it's somewhat similar to the Masonic Lodge. And again, we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. But the point is, you come under the headship authority of that man that is the, the, um, the worthy patron, quote-unquote, of that chapter of the Eastern Star. And he, in turn, is under the authority of his worshipful master at the Masonic Lodge. In fact, almost all Eastern Star bodies that I'm aware of or was aware of back then meet in Masonic Lodges on the off night when 
when uh, the regular Masonic meetings aren't taking place because they, they might have meetings three or four nights a week. And one of those might be the Eastern Star. So there's this whole headship thing. It's like you, even if you're a good Christian woman, you go to church, you try to keep the commandments, do all this good stuff. Maybe you're even filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, whatever. Saved by the blood, that's all fine. But when you walk into that lodge door and you kneel at the altar of the Eastern Star, which as we'll see is actually a very satanic symbol, and swear oaths on that altar, you come under the headship authority of the Masonic Lodge. And the ultimate Elohim deity of the Masonic Lodge is Baal, or Lucifer, or Satan, if you prefer. And that brothers and sisters, but especially sisters, is why those women were being visited by these hairy goat demon Baphomet type figures. Okay, so where did this all start? Well, for whatever reason, there was a guy named Rob Morris, Dr. Rob Morris, who decided to start something like this, a woman's auxiliary for the Freemasonic order, because women, of course, are not allowed to be Masons. And basically, he started putting this together in the mid-1800s. And he was a past Grand Master of a Masonic Lodge. So this guy was a big muckety-muck in the Masonic body. And at first he, call, he was called, in fact, the Poet Laureate of Masonry. So this guy was no, you know, Masonic lightweight. He was a very important individual in American Masonry. Now, in 1868, this fellow, right after the Civil War, this fellow got to know Robert McCoy, who was probably one of the most influential um, non-Scottish Rite Masons in America. And in fact, he became a publisher. A lot of the Masonic books you see are to this day published by McCoy Publishing, which was his outfit that he started. And he transferred the authority for the Eastern Star unto him. And because he was such a, this McCoy guy was such a bigwig in the Masonic body nationally, it really took off. And I'm not going to get into all the details again, as I was saying. Those are available in the video, uh, Ladies of the Labyrinth, because I want to keep this reasonably brief. However, let me just explain. If you go to the Eastern Star uh, organization, you will see that it has a, a floor plan, very similar to the Masonic Lodge, except in the center of it, there's this giant pentagram this giant five-pointed star. And then up on the eastern end of the, uh, what you call it, the, the lodge room or the chapter room is a, like a high place, a, a dais or whatever you want to call it, where the worthy patron and the worthy matron sit. But around this star are these five stations, these five star points that are represented by officers, female officers in the lodge or the chapter. And then in the center of this five-pointed star is the altar. And the five-pointed star has five colors to the five points. And around this altar are these five, these women represent five characters out of the Bible. These are Ada and Esther and... Uh, Basically, uh, let's see, uh, Ada, Esther, Ruth, and um, uh, Martha, and then Electa. Now, you might say, well, who the heck is Ada? Well, Ada is the name that they made up for Jephthah's daughter, uh, which I'll get into more on these different individual women in a minute. But And Electa is the name they used. Uh, for the, the real historical female character that's mentioned by John the Revelator, John the Beloved, in his second epistle, he, she isn't called Electa, she is called the Elect Lady and her children. Okay, so we're going to get into more of that in a minute, but I just wanted to lay this out. So you've got this colorful five-pointed star, and in the center is the altar where the, where the woman who's an initiate will take the oath. Let's look at these star point officers. Ada is um, representing Jephthah's daughter. Now, this is a weird story. It's one of the more baffling stories that are in the book of Judges, which is a kind of unnerving historical book anyway. And I won't go into why at this point, but there's a lot of 
you know, content in there that let's just say it's not suitable for younger viewers. And uh, anyhow, younger readers. Anyway, in Judges, there's this, this particular judge named Jephthah. And he um, swears an oath to the Almighty that if he can go out and win this battle, that whatever thing comes through the door of his house to greet him, <clears throat> excuse me, when he comes back from the battle being the victor, he will offer that animal as a sacrifice to the Almighty. Okay, so he wins the battle, he comes home, and his daughter, his only virgin daughter, comes out to greet him singing and playing the tambourine because she's happy that he won the battle, not knowing, of course, about this dire oath. So he goes, alas, my daughter, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's the secret word of this star point. It's alas, my daughter. And so the conventional, what do you call it, um, interpretation of this is that he basically goes and sacrifices his daughter on an altar to Elohim because he's a good mason, quote unquote, and he honors his oath above all else, even to the point of sacrificing his child. Now, this is sick. First of all, Elohim forbids human sacrifice. Second of all, you know, the, there are passages that I, I go into this in more detail in DVD, but let me just briefly say this. In the book, in the chapter, it says, when he, when he explains to his daughter what's going on, in verse 37 of chapter 11, we read, And she, this is the daughter, who's not named in the scripture, said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone, go alone two months, then I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows, meaning her, I suppose, girlfriends. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass that uh, when she returned to her father, he did with her according to his vow which she had vowed. And she knew no man. And it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to the lament, the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, those four days a year. Okay, now, a lot of commentators that understand Hebraic thought, and even many Christian ones, will just discard what the, the way the Eastern Star and some other biblical scholars take of this passage. They will say no. The discussion there about her virginity meant that basically she became a lifelong virgin. She took a vow of chastity, which would have been almost as bad as dying because, you know, every girl wants, to, well, most girls want to get married. They want to have children. And she had to eschew this because, of course, the Almighty would forbid any kind of human sacrifice. So this is the, an alternative explanation. But here's the creepy thing about this. And I, I'm spending more time on this because I want to drive something home here. Masons are big on taking oaths, okay? It's a huge deal for a Freemason when they take these dire oaths. And believe me, they are dire. And I'll probably spend another whole thing talking about Freemasonry. We have several, we probably have a dozen DVDs out there on it, but I don't think I've actually done, we've done a video, excuse me, on the shrine, which is part of the Masons. But the oaths that are in Masonry are truly horrible. And, and so they, they, they have this idea, oh, well, if you break your oath, you know, you're going to have your cut, your throat cut and your tongue torn out and your eyes pierced with daggers and your skull smote off and all this bizarre. This is in the rituals. I went through this stuff. I am not making this stuff up, even though it sounds like something out of a cheap horror movie. This is masonry. And they work this stuff in to the Eastern Star ritual, even though they don't have those kind of horrible oaths for these women with delicate sensibilities, but the idea is still there. If you make an oath, you keep it no matter what, even if it hurts your family, even if it kills a, a child in your family. And believe me, let me say this. If you're a Mason, hear me. If you're an Eastern star wife or whatever, hear me. We have had families where the daughter or the son of a Freemason or grandchild of a Freemason was killed horribly, and it was because of their parents or grandparents or whatever involvement in Freemasonry. 
It is literally sending your child to the fires of Moloch. Seriously. Okay, that was kind of a, a rant there, and I apologize, but it's true. It is absolutely true. The consequences of being a Freemason, especially to your children, are dire. And if your children, if you're a Freemason, your children okay, you are still okay. You need to get down on your face before the throne and cry out to Yahushua and ask him to forgive you for joining that wretched lodge and get out of it. And send them a letter of demit. We have a copy of how to do that on our website. End of the conversation. But my point is this, by lionizing this character, this Jephthah, who may or may not have been a sterling individual, because a lot of these judges were sort of questionable individuals. I mean, look at Samson. The guy was the worst Nazarite ever. And yet, you know, he's in the book of Judges. He's probably the most famous of all the judges. So, you know, they lionized this guy because he kept his oath. Well, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Okay, now... Then the next one is Ruth, and she is the custodian of what they call the yellow ray, the yellow ray of the star, okay? And I'm not going to get into all the depth, and most of us know the story of Ruth because it's a very charming, popular story from the, the uh, Tanakh. But essentially, uh, the problem with it is it's not nearly as grave as what I was just going through with Jephthah's daughter, but the problem there is uh, it creates an opposite effect because, as I mentioned, if you are the wife of a Freemason, you have this toxic headship over yourself. On the other hand, and this is what's kind of ironic, Ruth, who's a great heroine of the Bible, she got her covering from Boaz, who was a righteous man and who, who took her under his under his talit, literally in, in the in the in the book, and ended up marrying her, and you know of course she became the grandmother of Melch Dawid, King David, who was obviously the sweet psalmist of Israel and one of the greatest figures in the Old Testament. So wonderful story, but it's it's kind of a flip of the fact that if you are in the Eastern Star, you are under this toxic headship of this Masonic worthy patron. Okay, the third point of the star is Esther. And again, not a lot of stuff to talk about there. I don't want to make this overly long. Uh, the fourth point of the star is Martha. And um, basically, there the only problem that I have with the story, and of course this is when we get into the New Testament, is the fact that they go through this whole account of Lazarus being raised from the dead, and yet they never they never really present the gospel of Yahushua. A woman, if she was an unsaved individual, or just a nominal Christian, and let me tell you something, folks. With all due respect to these various Christian churches, you know, uh, especially mainline denominations, you know, Methodists and Lutherans and whatnot, you know, um, Anglicans, most of those people are not saved. They think either because they go to church or because they were dunked as an infant or whatever, that they're somehow in the kingdom of heaven. And they're not. And I don't mean to rain on anybody's parade, but they're not. I mean, I remember I would give altar calls in like a Lutheran church and half the church would come forward for salvation because they didn't even know if they were saved. That's sick. That's the church. This is the fault of the churches. This isn't the fault of the individual members. So my point is, you know, this Martha story, they carefully avoid the idea, okay, you, you've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or you are going to go to hell. Yeah, it says he is the resurrection and the life. But the way they put it out there, they kind of make him sound a little bit like, because you know, in masonry, they have this whole thing, and I can't get into it, it's too long, but about the slain and risen God, Osiris, Hiram of Biff, all of this stuff. And again, I go into this in greater depth in the DVD, but suffice it to say that they basically gloss over the unique character of the Messiah, the unique fact that Yahushua is the son of the living Elohim, he is Yah come in the flesh, and he is the only true source of of eternal life and resurrection. So they, they don't really make that clear. 
and they don't tell the woman who's sitting there listening to this beautiful gospel story, but to her, it may very well be just a story. There is no evangelistic content to it. There is no besarot. There is no good news. There is no gospel because she doesn't know how to get saved. And she can hear all these pretty stories until, you know, they're coming out of her ears and she should, could still be as lost as a golf ball on a wheat field. Because I knew all these stories when I was a Mormon, when I was a Catholic. I knew all of these happy little stories and I didn't know the real Yahushua from a doorknob. And if I had died, I'd have gone straight to hell. And because these women are presented with this false, candy-coated Christianity, or pseudo-Christianity, it's not helpful. Now, the other thing, and by the way, she's the green ray. Uh, and we're going to talk more about this whole ray thing in a minute. But anyway, the, um, the fact of the matter is, the last one is uh, Electa, I kind of explained about her, she's the character out of Second uh, John, the, the elect lady and her children that, that, that the apostle talks about. And again, we don't know hardly anything about this woman except that she was a mother of children. And there's some Bible scholars that even believe that she may have been a, she may have been a church. You know, the, 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 she may have been a symbol for a church and then her children would be the body of the church, you know, the membership of the church. But who knows? The, anyway, the point is they make this whole story up. And again, I don't want to go into depth on it about her and this and that. And again, you can go through this whole thing, this whole, and it's long. I mean, if you go through this ritual, it is as dull as dust. I mean, it wouldn't be more interesting for you to sit there and watch paint dry. I kid you not. And I had to sit through this stuff because I was a lodge officer or a chapter officer. So, in any event, you can go through all this stuff and never know Yahushua, really. Now, I'm not saying there aren't many Christian women in this organization, because I'm sure there are. But it's just not there. Okay, let me get into the whole thing about the star, because um, I don't want this to be really long. Here's the deal. You have these five points of the star. And we've got these five biblical women, uh, more or less, who are uh, on the points of the star. But why, the, why are they using a pentagram? Because that's what this is. This is a giant pentagram laid out on the floor. And if you've ever seen, like, sometimes you'll see on the back of a car, you'll see like a sticker with the eastern star symbol on it, or you might even see it on the door of a lodge. It's an inverted pentagram, an upside down pentagram, and we're going to put up a graphic here to show you what the Eastern Star logo is. They call it the signet of the Eastern Star. And you'll see it, it, it is a pentagram. Now, a pentagram is a symbol of witchcraft. And when you go through it, I, again, I was a Wiccan high priest for 16 years. Well, I was a Wiccan for 16 years and a high priest for nine of those years. And in witchcraft, you originally learn there are these three goddesses, the the maiden, which is the, the new moon, and then there's the full moon, who's the mother goddess, and then there's the darker, you know, the, wa the waning moon, who is like the old crone, the old wise woman. Okay, what you learn in the higher degrees is that there's two other goddesses, okay? So there's actually five, one for each point of the star. And those goddesses, the two extra ones, are the, the uh, sensuous lover, and also the, um, and the sister. Okay, now, we have to ask, what did this guy, this Dr. Rob Morris, really have in mind when he put this stuff together? Because, and I, I document this more fully in the DVD, but it just fits too perfectly with witchcraft. Let me explain. For example, okay, so you've got these five goddesses, you've got these five biblical characters. Each one exemplifies one of these pagan goddesses. Like, for example, Ada is a virgin, okay? She's the virgin goddess. Esther is the crone. And I admit that's a bit of a stretch, but, you know, on the DVD I explain why I think that. Then you have Ruth, who is the lover. I mean, you know, and, and part of that is because she comes out of a... Um, a 
pagan culture. She's a Moabite, and there's there's stories about how she was actually a priestess of Moloch before she, you know, married into into Naomi's family, and that, that she may have been a temple harlot. Uh, of course, then she got she became a devout uh, Israelite. But anyway, and then we have um, Martha, who's the sister, and we have Electa, who's the mother. So we have all five faces of this, this mother goddess figure. And that's kind of a, you know, a kind of coincidence, don't you think? In addition, we have the fact that the star itself is widely understood and has been for centuries to be the devil star. I mean, I mentioned this thing by a lifeless Levi in the 19th century, this drawing of bafflement, but it goes back even further than that, centuries. And the idea is, is if you have a pentagram with a, with a single point up, it's, it's white magic. If you have a pentagram with a single point downward, it is black magic. And you all you have to do is go find a copy, I mean, don't actually find a copy, but look it up on like Amazon or Google or something of the Satanic Bible. You will see right on the cover there's an inverted pentagram with a goat's head in it. That's, that's bafflement. And it's even called the bafflement symbol by devout Satanists, if that's not an oxymoron. And, you know, all through whether it's, you know, the Church of Satan, the Temple of Set, or this new, you know, satanic temple, I think it's called, that's so politically active right now. All of these groups, they all have this inverted pentagram as their symbol. In fact, this satanic um, temple outfit, they've actually created a 3D sculpture of the bafflement figure that they put, they're try, they've been putting in various state capitals under the Freedom of Religion Clause of the Constitution. And, and it even has two adoring little children sitting at the feet of this satanic goat gazing up at him in rapt love or whatever, or ecstasy or something. It's really kind of sick. But anyhow, and I say this as a former Satanist, so why did this guy, this Rob Morris, pick the satanic symbol to be at the heart of this ritual group of women? Now, here's the thing. The women themselves are told, well, you know, it says in the Gospels, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So they say, well, we're the eastern star because we're coming to worship Jesus, quote unquote. Well, eh, not really. See, they're, they're messing with these women's heads and it's, it's really deceptive and it's really satanic. Let me explain why. Centuries ago, way back before even the time of Messiah, the term eastern star did not refer to the star of Bethlehem. As far as this is before Yahushua was born, instead it referred to Sirius. It was called the Eastern Star or the Star in the East. Now let's look at the Gospel account in Matthew. It says, "We have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him." Fine, but if you think about it, let's let's look at a basic geography lesson. Most Bible scholars know and will tell you that these wise men were from Babylon or from, you know, Persia or the some place that was east of Bethlehem, you know, where today modern day Iraq, modern day Iran, wherever. So they the, they were in the east, the wise men, and they saw the star. The star could not have been in the east because if the star had been in the east, they would have headed to China. Instead, they were in the east and they saw the star. I mean, it's, it, it's slightly confusing. And the devil loves to, to deceive people by, you know, taking um, nomenclature like that and, and messing with it. So these poor women are thinking, oh, we're, we're an eastern star. Oh, we're so wonderful. We're following Jesus. la di da di da Well, no, you're not. The eastern star is Sirius. And Sirius is the uh, star of Set, who is the uh, pagan uh, Satan, if you will, of the Egyptian pantheon. He's a dog-headed god. I've done a couple of videos about him in relation to the dog days, which we're just coming out of now. They, they start in uh, 
July 23rd-ish. And uh, right now this video is being made on the 1st of September. But the point is, this is a very evil, dark star. The other thing I want to explain is that Albert Pike, who was arguably the most influential Mason of the 19th century, even more so than McCoy and uh, this, this uh, guy that started the Eastern Star, he was the supreme grand commander of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction. And he, he's, he's actually buried in the, in the uh, house of the temple in Washington, D.C. And I could do a whole thing on that guy because he was a total creep. But in any event, he was a Lucifer worshiper. He worshiped Lucifer, and he was a supreme mason over all the Scottish right of the southern jurisdiction. He was also the, the chief, uh, what do I call it, supreme court justice of the Ku Klux Klan. Isn't that wonderful? So the guy was a bad dude. And in his writings, which are widely accepted as some of the most deep, profound, philosophical works on Scottish Rite Masonry in the world, he talks about that in, at the center of every Masonic lodge on the floor is a blazing star. And he identifies this blazing star as the star of Set, the star of Sirius. And it's a five-pointed star. So we're talking about the same thing here. And parenthetically, let me just say this. There's all sorts of people out there that are now saying, oh, well, that reference in Acts chapter 7 to the, the star of Remfam or, or Cayune or whatever, that that's the six-pointed star. That's the Magan Dawid, the star of David. No, it isn't. It is the five-pointed pentagram star, and we're going to do a whole uh, video on that shortly. But... Uh, for now, let me just make it clear that according to every occult authority, and, and believe me, Albert Pike was an occult authority, uh, the five-pointed star is evil, and the five point, especially inverted, and the five-pointed star is a symbol of set, and it is, you know, it is the star of Remfam, it is a star that was talked about, the star of Moloch, etc., etc. We'll, we'll explain more about that in this other video. I don't want to get too far off into the weeds here. But here's the point. He, Pike, identifies this as being the star of set. And if this is on the floor of every, of every Eastern star chapel or, or chapter, and these women kneel at this altar at, right in the center of this star, and they swear an oath. And they think, when they say, oh, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him, that the him is Yahushua. But what if it isn't? What if it's Baphomet? What if it's Satan? Or whatever name you choose to call it. And I don't think it's a coincidence, one of the, one of the most iconic important satanic symbols is the signet of the eastern star it's like a it's like a trap it's like a trap in which these innocent women walk in there because 99 out of 100 of these women know nothing about the occult they know nothing about witchcraft or any of this stuff and they just think oh my mother was in this or my husband is in this and it's just wonder and they're, they're sweet wonderful people but they're being lured into this satanic death trap because let me tell you, even if these women don't have hairy goat demons showing up in their bedroom at night, that doesn't mean that there is not a spiritual impact on them and on their children and on their grandchildren. And even if for whatever reason, maybe their own devotion to Yahushua is so exemplary that it kind of slides off of them, but it's going to hit the weakest, most vulnerable members of your family if you do not renounce this stuff and repent it. This is the star of Set that you are kneeling before, that you are swearing upon an altar. And remember, again, Yahushua says, don't swear oaths. And that's repeated in James. James says, above all else, my brethren, swear no oaths. And yet here are these women and all these masons swearing these oaths. Now, again, the oaths that are in the Eastern Star are pretty benign compared to the oaths that the masons swear, but they're still blood oaths. They're still, you're still swearing on a holy Bible. They got the King James Bible. Now, talk about blasphemy. This King James Bible is laid open on this altar in the center of this satanic star. How creepy is that? 
And again, most women don't get this. I'm sure 99% of the women in the Eastern Star are totally oblivious to this. And that makes it all the more heinous. Now, I want to close with two things. One is some of you may have heard of a particularly creepy individual still alive today named Michael Aquino. He is the head of the Temple of Set, which is the most, um, one of the most influential satanic groups of the 20th and 21st century. It was an offshoot of the Church of Satan, and it's much smaller than the other bodies, but it's very creepy. And he, he basically worships Set, this Egyptian demon, God headed, a dog headed deity, okay? And he also, in his writings, and I used to write, read this guy's stuff because I thought he was great when I was a devil worshiper. Uh, he, he talks all the time, and it, it's documented in many places, and also in my book, Mason, Masonry Beyond the Light, that, that the, the, the five-pointed star, and especially the inverted five-pointed star, the eastern star, is the star of Set. It's the star of Sirius. It's this dark, powerful occult energy. So both a 19th century occult master and a 20th slash 21st century occult master agree. This thing is evil, and if you have sworn an oath at that altar of the evil star, you need to get out of that thing, renounce it, you need to repent it. And that's what I will end up by saying. Uh, I kind of went over this quickly in the beginning, but if you are an Eastern star woman, or if you're an Eastern star guy, and also a Mason, I would assume, you need to renounce it. You need to get down on your knees right now and pray to Moshiach and just just renounce all the oaths that you have taken. For, ask him, the, our master, to forgive you for taking those oaths. And if you go onto our website, we have a prayer uh, of deliverance that you need to go through. It's called Deliverance Procedure. It's under, it's under Deliverance and Liberation, which is a sub-menu under Prayers. And um, it mentions there the strongmen of masonry because they're a demonic strongmen for masonry. Thing uh, like Baphomet, Nimrod, and uh, Javalon, and um, again, Baal, and Hiram Abiff, and so on. You need to renounce those, those strongmen. You need to renounce the oaths that you took. Then, having done that, and, and again, whether you're the husband or the wife or whether you're a single man or a single woman that's involved in the star or the masons, you need to renounce it. If you have any bric-a-brac bric or paraphernalia, you know, aprons or rings or jewelry or documents, you need to burn them or destroy them. Get them out of your house. I don't care if they take them out in the woods and bury them in a ditch. Get rid of them. And then you need to send a letter if you're a woman, you would send it to the Grand Chapter of the Eastern Star in whatever state you live in. If you're a guy, you need to send it to the Grand Chapter of the Eastern Star, but also to the Grand Lodge of the Freemasons to which you may be uh, beholden in the state you're in. And if, and if either of these individuals are in other Masonic bodies, they need to, because there's several women's organizations, like the Daughters of the Nile, which is like for the Shriners, you know, stuff like that. And for the men, there are four or five different organizations you can be a part of. So understand me, this is critically important. You need, to, you need to spiritually sever ties, and then by writing the letter, you legally sever the ties. Uh, but because if you send them a letter, they are pretty much obligated, a letter of demit, legally, to take your name off the rolls of the Masonic Order. And again, we have a sample letter available on our website. So this kind of got long, and I apologize, but this is really important because many, many women are involved in this group that are good Christian women, and they don't understand the profound spiritual impact that this can have on their lives and on the lives of their children and grandchildren. So anyway, if this is uh, the kind of information you find helpful, if you think this is a valuable channel that we're running here. This is now over 130 videos we have out there for free. Please pray for us. Please subscribe and share this video. 
And also, please pray about supporting us because we, we're, we're totally a faith-based ministry and we need your prayers and we need your financial support. If you want to be a regular supporter, that would be great. We would totally appreciate it. We thank you so much. And again, we have lots of resources on our website, both free uh, prayers and documents. We have a little straight talk teaching on the Eastern Star on various aspects of masonry. And we have lots of DVDs on masonry and the one that I mentioned several times on the Order of the Eastern Star. It's called Ladies of the Labyrinth. So we've got a lot of stuff for you to inform you and to bless you and to empower you. And that's what our ministry is all about, to be a watchman on the wall, to warn believers about this kind of spiritual peril and also to exhort them to pray and to press in the Messiah because these are perilous times we are in. So thank you so much. Pray for us. Pray about supporting us. And may you be richly blessed. Shalom. Shalom.